Hey everyone, Jordan here at the Music Zoo, with my boss, Music Zoo owner Tommy Coletti. And uh, today we want to do something different. With Music Zoo, we're always talking about guitars, obviously. We're talking about gear, we're talking about guitars, we're talking about music, we're talking about history. And today we're going to wrap it all together because we're talking about the legendary Gary Moore. So when I think of Gary Moore, I don't know all that much about him. I know he was in Thin Lizzy, I know he was incredible, I know he played a lot of blues records, I know he played on Black Rose by Thin Lizzy, but Tommy, you, um, you brought up a record the other day that neither me or Garrett or anyone here really heard of before, and which one was that? And that was Card as a Power, which I have here. Uh, here you go. So when this record came out, so I, like you, mm -hmm. knew Thin Lizzy, was a fan of Thin Lizzy, and, and, and the, you know, the double guitar leads, and both of them, both Scott Gorham, Gary Moore, mm -hmm. at times it was Brian Robertson, John Sykes, the, the list of guitar players at Thin Lizzy yeah. was just absolutely incredible, right? And then one guy after another was just fantastic. And probably one of my, I love Thin, Thin Lizzy so much that it's kind of hard for me to define like who's the greatest or whatever. Right, however, they're all great. They're all great. But Gary Moore just like just affected me, right? Mm -hmm. And and I remember following his career a little bit, and he had been in like some fusion bands before he was at a band called Coliseum, uh, and he was in a Skid Row before the Skid Row. I don't know if you knew that. Oh, it was no. a completely different Crazy. thing. It wasn't like a metal band and those yeah. Asher Bach. Um, but when he went out and started doing his own solo stuff, it was really exciting to me. And I, you know, you gotta go back in time. No internet, no like real way to find out stuff that was coming out other than like Cream Magazine or Hit Parader Magazine and the record stores. Right. So it was a friend of mine that I was jamming with as a kid that I grew up in Middle Village, Queens yeah. <laughs> with. And, and she used to, she played bass, she used to go to uh, Pat. She used to go to, she worked in New York City and she worked like right next to J&R Records down, okay, yeah. downtown. Yep. So after work, every day we'd go to J&R and just see what was new. And I think she spent all of her money at, from work on, all, rec, on records. all been there, yeah. Right? Yeah. And she brings home the Carters and Power record. And I lose my mind, I'm just like, you gotta be kidding me. I didn't, had no idea that this was happening. Yeah, yeah. What year was that? This is 83. It was like the beginning of 83. Mm -hmm. And a lot of stuff, you know, a lot of stuff was happening at that point. There was, there was, you know, besides the Van Halen thing, right? right. There was Michael Shanker. And Michael Shanker was in UFO, and then he started his own solo thing. And I wanna say that was in, in like 80, 81 area. And then Gary Moore, and all these, these really fantastic guitar players were coming out. And right around the time that this record came out, a Thin Lizzy record called Thunder and Lightning came okay. out that I used to, if you guys remember from like way back in the Little Neck days, I used to like probably play it all the time. Just drive right? everybody crazy yeah, yeah. with that record because <laughs> there's some legendary uh, yeah. great riffs on that record that actually are shared with this, which is we'll get into. Oh, I like that. Um, there's a there's a song called uh, Cold Sweat on the Thin Lizzy record mm -hmm. that is pretty much close to a tune on here. Which is I mean, which is kind of funny, like that they kind of remember. borrowed from from each other. Uh, cold hearted. And I they, mean, if you have a good riff, I've done it. Use it more than once. So it's it not a bad idea. It happens, right? Yeah. It's same key, same everything. Just like yeah. Gary Moore kind of slowed it down. And what was great about this Gary Moore record, and you have to go back again in the early '80s. There was sort of you know like there was these ballads like open arms from Journey and like these love songs mm -hmm. and stuff. And then on the other side of it, there was just like these great heavy metal or hard rock guitar players yeah. and bands. And it was this now beginning stages of like the power ballads. Right. And Gary Moore, f f it, uh, there's, uh, you even mentioned this to me because we, we were going to talk about, we knew we were going to talk about this and you yeah. went and listened to this listen record. To it, yeah. And you were surprised that there was like, it wasn't just like all. Well, I was like, yeah, like Gary Moore or like any like 80s solo guitar player record that I've heard, usually it's just like, Right off the bat, it's not really like a songwriting oriented piece of music. It's just like and then like but Gary Moore, there's like melody, there's like great vocals, yeah. there's vocal hooks right off the bat, which were sick. Right and I was kind bat. of like I said to you, it was like, yeah, like after each verse, it'd be like a flashy lick or like out of the chorus. Right. It'd be like a bloop, but nothing like guitar focused. It was still about nothing the song. Guitar focused. Yeah. It was still about the song. It right. was still taking like pulling whatever you know, these guys had learned from the 70s, you know, in songwriting yeah, and right. execution and everything and bring it into early 80s. And now equipped with like, you know, like he was playing a Fiesta Red Strat a lot on that Carter's Power record. He mm. also had like, which everybody knows because of Kirk Hammett is the greeny guitar. Right, the most he famous that, guitar of all time. And that's, yeah. the, that's on the album cover. It's really hard to see oh, with wow, this, yeah. but it's actually physically on the cover. 
Um, yeah, there it is. And he, yeah, he, played, burst. he played it. He played it a lot on this album yeah. too. So it was the two guitars, and then he had a Charvel. I think that Grow Red made him a Charvel at one point. He was playing that. Um, but it was interesting because now you have a lot of these power ballads on here. He's right. singing, he's playing piano, and just everything. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, the guitar solo comes, and it's just not like shred. It's yeah. it's well thought out. It, some of it's bluesy. Great. Some of it's like kind of classical oriented yeah. a little so, bit. So if anything, it's the blend between the '70s like hard rock, Gary Moore, and then what led up to be the still got the blues and and the stuff right. that maybe you knew that became like Gary Moore probably the most famous part of his f career and maybe the most records that he sold was the blues era. Yeah, true. But we, and and we play this game a lot here. You know, like let's talk about a specific band or guitar player. And you have to really dig down deep and find like, well, what defined that band, right? Yeah. What defined that guitar player? So uh, you know, we talk about Eddie Van Halen in here all the time. Like if I told you, like if you were on a desert island and you listened to like, finish what you started with like Sammy mm -hmm. Hagar and stuff, it's great. It's guitar, guitar playing's great. It's yeah. kind of like a country lick and stuff. But that wouldn't define who Eddie Van Halen is. No. You'd have to listen to Van Halen one to get right. a better idea, right? So I think that sometimes when, when people listen to somebody like Gary Moore, they go, oh, I've, I've heard Gary Moore, still got the blues, right? And it's just yeah. like, it's like eh, yeah, go back. Yeah. Let's go back. Let's go back to Thin Lizzy and yeah, listen yeah. to that guitar playing and the double the harmony solos that they were writing and playing that were just fantastic. Yeah. Um, there's enough footage out on YouTube now that if you if you do your homework, you could find something Lizzie with Gary Moore, and it's all fantastic. Um, and this album kind of was like right in the middle. Yeah. The songs were great, and it was to me very exciting. And it's so he, can I drop a name? Here I go. <sighs> Talking to Warren D. Martini. Warren right. D. Martini. Let's let's segue into it. All right. So, Actually, wait, before we get into that, you made a great point about this the other day that talking about the songwriting on this record, how it kind of like gave rise to the power ballad and like later 80s hard rock. Like it kind of gave dudes who were shredding like the pass to like write a nice chorus and like sing instead of like it did. And be you badass could, all the and time. And you could say, dare I say, like the Bon Jovi's of the world and bands like that right. borrowed from these records you know, yeah. uh, Aldo Nova. Like, I don't know how many people know Aldo mm, Nova, but Aldo Nova yeah. had a few a few hits in the right. early 80s and stuff, and for, you know. But until going from that, talking about Warren Demartini, uh, if we could zoom in right here, maybe like the influence of War this record on Warren, if we could zoom in right there, what is that image? But the bomber that's on Warren's Charvel signature guitar, right, right, right there, and, and he knew this album, right, yeah, yeah. and he pointed that out picture to Glenn at I guess who was painting mm -hmm. for Charvel back then, and it was just like, can you do that? Right, like, yeah, off that, and it came from this record, you know, it's like, crazy. Admit yeah. it, admit yeah, it, yeah. Like, I mean, just yeah, you know. if you have a good idea, take it. Yeah, yeah. so it was just, <laughs> all this stuff was an influence yeah. off off all these different guitar players, and it was kind of the bridge between the Warren D. Martinis right. of the world and you know guys that were coming out like with the. I forget exactly what year they were. Was it like 84, 85, 86? You know, and then, and then Gary Moore, who was like right in the early part of the 80s, where still like, it was still, other than, other than Led Zeppelin and Van Halen, which mm. was still gaining popularity in 1983, right? They were still kind of yeah. like, they were selling out arenas. They but were not huge. Like, but it was just like, you had to be like in the know to know about Van Halen. Even though like you went to the garden, right. and you could see, like I went to Madison Square Garden Ju Ju uh, July 17th, 1981. I was a kid. The memory. <laughs> and it, I'll never forget it. I was, yeah. And I was at Madison Square Garden as a kid, you know, like watching Van Halen for the first time. That was the Fair Warning Tour. Valerie Bertinelli was standing on the side of the stage. You could see her from where I was sitting. Oh, I could crazy. see her standing yeah, on the yeah. side, like watching them. It was a big deal. I think it had been the first time they, they headlined the Garden. Probably, um, yeah. But other than Van Halen, and it was kind of like this huge cult following at that point. They hadn't gained like... They, they were on the radio, they were popular, but there was no number one hits or anything yeah. like that. There was still a lot of other things that were dominating the radio. And then, you know, it wasn't until 1984 that really kind of like it took, it took the world over and stuff. Yeah. But this stuff was coming up too, you know, so now like there's all yeah. these like great guitar players. The whole world of like hard rock. Writing these, yeah. these beautiful songs and, and there's, there's shredding on here too. So now, oh, yeah. uh, what's the one song that I was listening to in the car this morning, I was like, End of the world. End it's just like world. it starts with the solo. Right. So it starts with the guitar solo, kind yeah. of eruption esque, right? But completely different yeah, than yeah. eruption. And uh, 
Jack Bruce from Cream oh, no is kidding. saying lead on that song. Oh, so okay, it's not cool. Gary Moore. Uh, and he starts with this whole shred, and then they go into this, yeah. this unbelievably powerful song. That's the world we were living in in 1982, where you could start a five-minute song with a guitar solo. With a guitar solo. <laughs> Ian Pace was playing drums on that record. Oh, wow, it was okay. Deep Purple. Right, 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 right. Neil Murray was in Whitesnake beforehand, and uh, he played with Gary Moore. He played. Um, right. He was in several several different bands that were just like, was he in Deep Purple too? They'll correct me on the internet. Probably not. Um, definitely Whitesnake. Right. Um, so it's kind of like an all-star cast of like that's probably why the record is halfway so good because he's got yeah. phenomenal players to, great. to play his music. Everybody's great, yeah. you know. So and uh, Glenn Hughes is also singing on this record too. Oh wow, another Deep Purple right. alumni, yeah. Yeah. right? Um, so really wonderful. I lost my mind over this record and I went over it over and over again, and especially like the the power ballads and you know like I could probably shred a couple of yeah. Them, so now maybe here and there. if you want like playing the Red Strat. Play a couple of riffs that maybe are some of your favorites that like yeah sure influence your playing as you became like absolutely a even better guitar player you know Ab absolutely let's get yeah. into that yeah let's do it cool so we were talking about the two riffs right and oh uh, yeah so here's here's cold hearted or uh, kind of like cold hearted from Gary Moore. <laughs> Then Lizzie, <laughs> Cold Sweat, yeah. came out same year, right around the same time. And he's on that song, too. And I mean, him been Phil Lynn and the Friends, and like, yeah, yeah. no, no, John oh, Sykes is playing oh, okay. on the, on the uh, Cold Sweat. <laughs> Like so, like if you can't borrow riffs from your friends, what do you got? I, I guess so, right? Yeah. So like, just a funny thing. I think the Cold Sweat one has got more like more distortion and more like less. It's a little more like digging in more. Yeah. yeah. The other one seems a little more like punky. More is more. The other one, Cold Hearted, is more like a love song or where right. he's actually singing that he's cold hearted. Yeah, yeah. You know, so. All right. So moving on from there, uh, maybe like show us some other riffs or leads that are some of your favorites from the record. I mean, so many great riffs. Even the beginning of the album, the way it opens up. <laughs> The thing that I found interesting about Gary Moore's playing mm -hmm. that you don't uh, don't hold me to this, folks. But like back in like the '70s and '80s, I felt like guitar players really like attacked the guitar. They did. Yeah, oh, yeah. You had a fight for every note. You had a fight because the marshals were fighting you. Yeah. There wasn't enough gain, and there wasn't all this stuff. Right. And and you find that these guitar players, or some of them, like really muscled. The instrument, you know, yeah. like, and now there's tons of gain and there's tons right. of delay. Yeah. <laughs> and we could all just kind of hang out and just play. And right, just like right. It all just, it's very smooth. You can tap and, dance your way into a solo now, but and it dictates the way that you approach the guitar. So yeah. like, and and now I guess because there's so much gain, like I could sit back and smoke, right. smoke yeah. cigarettes too. But um, but back then the thing that blew me away was just like the attack that these guitar players have, yeah. you know? And that was one of the things that I felt like I took, you know, like just like I'm hitting the guitar yeah, as I mean, possible. We, as possible. we can see it in your playing. Like if we hand you a new guitar and you play it for a couple hours, we're like, I'm not so sure it's Oops. new anymore. <laughs> you're, you play super hard and I think it's what you're talking about. Like coming from like a 70s and 80s rock mentality where like, yeah, there wasn't, maybe you didn't have master volume on your Marshall and you just had to Play the hell out of it. You had to work it. Yeah. You had to work it to get the notes out. Right. And I think, that, you know, like since we're on the subject, a lot of those early records that everybody loves so much, it's very easy to go to the gain knob and just turn it all the way up and think you're getting there. But like yeah. a lot of those sounds that we love so much, whether it's Zeppelin or certainly the first couple of Van Halen records at ACDC, they're not as distorted as no, you perceive clean. them to be. Yeah. The, the distortion becomes like a uh, like perceiving the energy off the record almost yeah, if for that sure. makes any sense you yeah know, like and you start to perceive like it must be just higher gain or whatever and 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 somehow it gets lost with the higher gain yeah. so that was one of the things i took away from gary moore is that he just attacks the guitar and it was 
I, b I believe he used like 10s or 11s too. So he's like, I had a drummer friend. Of, I never met Gary, but a, f a drummer friend of mine from back mm -hmm. in the day had met Gary. And so the first, the thing I took away from meeting Gary Moore was when I shook his hand, it was like shaking a brick. I think I've heard this story before. I think he played like, a, he might have played 12s or something at some yeah, point. Yeah, right? really strong yeah. dude. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. and, and, and you knew it. And you could hear it in his gu guitar playing. So that was one of the things I took away. Yeah. Um, he had like a, just a lot of cool riffs that I thought were just like, you, you hear them nowadays more often, like using the open strings, but... <laughs> That's like end of the. That's the beginning of the end of the world right. solo. Whenever he does that thing, and and it's you know on its own. Sort of like digging in, and when you start the energy this, comes out, and that's what makes right. rock music and so. It, Start doing the pull-offs and you really hit and it. It becomes a different thing. He did a lot of just like. Stuff yeah. Like that. Just like really digging in and working it. I guess the other, the, one of the other things I took away from him was just like he would do a lot of like single string things that I hear like Nuno play. Okay. Yeah. And, um, Heard John Sykes do this stuff, a, a different sound and everything, but it's. You know, like it's just, it's, yeah. I'm hacking it, but, um, but that's a general idea. Yeah. And a lot of those records, like the White Snake record, he's doing that. John Sykes is doing that same kind of thing in Still of the Night. Yeah. And songs that, you know, gained a lot of popularity. But that was like some of the big stuff that I took away from Gary Moore. And yeah. then on the other side of it, he could just kind of like roll the tone off and get like that Clapton y kind of big oh, yeah. bluesy thing. Um, volume swells and things like that that he took from like probably from Roy Buchanan and people like right, that. So like there were so many like mixes. That, yeah of like stew in, yeah, in his what guitar playing stuff. what made him great. unique yeah so we covered quarters of power but i think you got a couple other records here you want to tell us about them i do all right i, I brought learning materials folks all right good folks uh so this is black rose thin lizzie right and this this was i guess this, this is the 70s and this came out and this was for like most thin lizzie fans like lost their minds with this record that's a great record i know that one great a record yeah. there's a lot of great tunes on this the playing is fantastic yeah. Um, but Gary didn't stick around in this band too long. From what I understand and what I've read, there's a lot, of, is, there's, a lot of drama. There's a lot of drama yeah. in the band. And, you know. So this is this is this is another one of the records that he was on. He was on Jet Records. So Jet Records was Sharon mm -hmm. Osbourne's dad. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. Jet right. Records, and that was the affiliation with Ozzy, and why he was kind of like. You know, like helping Ozzy to put a band together so right. he could, you know, put the Blizzard of Oz together. And didn't want, the story I also heard was that he didn't want to play with Ozzy because it was kind of, at that moment in time. Right, a little too close to home. A little too close to home. With so what he just dealt with, yeah. Right, so he didn't want to deal with this. This is a great album too. It's called that kind of looks like a... G-Force. This could almost be like a new wave cover. I don't know if that's it could what it's kinda, like, but... It's, it, the songs are, are, well, they're not new wavy, but they're, they're also rock based, but it's probably... Right. It's probably closer to that yeah. than, than certainly Some Carter's Some good fashion power. choices on her. That jacket is... I want that. Yeah. <laughs> Another Victims of the Future. Cool. What's that this one about? Is, this one, I mean, this is sort of a continuation of Carter's of Power. It gets heavier and even more rock. And, right, cool. and the guitar solos get even, you know, like even more incredible. Right. And, and he really started to kind of his, find his own as a rock guitar player, not as the blues guy. It was just right. like... When you listen, to, when you finish listening to this record, this was another one of those. I guess I should just quit playing the guitar because this is this right. Is it's like, what do I do here? I never can't, gonna, I can't beat this. Yeah, it's never gonna happen. Yeah, you know, like that good. Um, this is Run for Cover. I I happen to really like this record too because I thought the songs were really on here mm. were really fantastic. Uh, I have to assume this one is a little more like songwritery or something. Like Phil the... Linnett makes an appearance or two on this okay. album. I think. Um, what is and that there's, guitar? That's a Hamer. Oh wow! Yeah, that. that's a Hamer. Uh, that's cool. Yeah, he played a standard at one point. He's yeah. Gary, Gary Moore's gone through a lot of guitars, but he was a Charvel guy. Uh, right. Certainly in this era, there was a lot of Charvels being seen, but he still played the Fiesta Red Strat. The Les Paul was, was a constant 
while he was doing all this stuff and getting yeah. all those like hard rock tones out of that guitar. Yeah. I feel like it yeah. always comes back to Strata yeah. or Les Paul. Like, yeah. the more do you need? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's just you know this was one of those it's one of those moments here at the Music Zoo where we're talking about guitars and then it always leads into guitar players and you know like oh Gary Moore still got the blues. Or yeah. Hold on. Everyone's world could be opened. Let's go back. One record at a time. I mean, cool. Um, so hopefully you guys take away something from this that I took away as a, as a young dude. And yeah, someone that never heard him before. I love the records. They're super cool. Any young guitar players out there who haven't heard Gary Moore yet, I implore you to do so. Do your research. Thanks for watching. I think we'll do more of these videos. I hope so. Maybe leave a comment. Maybe uh, I'll give Tommy a record next of something I like, and we'll see what he thinks. There you go. Give you a Sugar record or something, something crazy. Don't, don't beat me up on the guitar playing. <laughs> I haven't played any no, of these no, no, in no. a long time. Come on. You know, so I had to. It's always good. All right. Out today. Thank you again for watching. Please like and subscribe. Follow us on all social media at The Music Zoo. Take care. Thanks.